We're going to try to cover a lot of ground because we have uh, two what I would call real experts with on the ground experience covering the Hong Kong protest movement. And they're also both very familiar with overall uh, U.S.-China relations. And they have thoughts that they've written a lot about on the future of China. Uh, first will be David J. Feith, who has an extensive uh, internet presence. If you, and I mean this in a positive way, David. <laughs> if you Google David Feith or David J. Feith, you will find his op-ed pieces uh, in the Wall Street Journal that cover not only Hong Kong, but many, many uh, other issues. And I just tweeted a few of them in the past few hours uh, so that those who follow uh, Mike Pillsbury's Twitter postings will have access to some of my favorite op-ed pieces you've written in the past year. So David will go first, and he will cover the broad issue of the uh, protest movement and what it means and what actually happened. And then Libby Liu will be our, our sort of media star because she has photos and a kind of description of what actually happened during the 79 days. And we will try to get to video coverage of the photo slides that Libby Leo goes through uh, one by one. And we'll also try to post uh, the most vivid photos uh, on the Hudson website. Uh, I think that as a moderator, my only duty is to try to raise some questions, uh, ideally as challenging as possible so that they, they're not too easy questions. Uh, and w one of my first questions is going to be about the legacy or the future significance of what happened during the 79 days. We have an interesting article online already that a piece of legislation that's been sponsored in the Senate by Sherrod Brown, Senator Sherrod Brown, and then the House by Congressman Chris Smith, this legislation really toughens up our original Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992. Uh, it's been criticized by two Chinese mainland professors in Beijing uh, just last month, uh, uh, Jin San Rong and Shi Ying Hong are the two professors. They come here frequently. Um, their critique is nobody really cares about democracy in Hong Kong in the American Congress. Uh, one of them says 200 and, no, 25,000 pieces of legislation are introduced every year, only 200 pass, and then he opines this will not even pass, and even if it does, the president won't sign it. So. This is the thrust from China in the past month or two that there's really no legacy of the 79-day uh, protest movement, and it will not influence the American Congress to pass new legislation. Now, that said, we're going to focus a little bit on the Hong Kong Policy Act that governs our policy toward Hong Kong now. It requires a report from our consulate. It has a series of measures that basically uh, put a condition that if America is going to treat Hong Kong separately and give it various kinds of privileges, then it has to have a high degree of autonomy. So the Hong Kong Policy Act brings these two things together. All of our treatment of Hong Kong in terms of trade and economics is linked to whether there's a high degree of autonomy or not. The new version of the law we can talk about, as I say, makes it tougher. So. The second large issue I hope we can raise today, and we're going to turn to questions from the audience fairly soon. The second big issue is whether democracy in China, in mainland China, which used to be a dream of the American government, whether that really has been influenced or not by the Hong Kong protest movement. There used to be a dream that as Taiwan becomes democratic and as Hong Kong is separate and moves toward democracy, this will somehow influence Beijing to move toward a multi-party uh, national system of elections. So we want to be, be, be careful to ask, be sure that we ask David Feith and Libby Liu both, what's the impact on Beijing of what's happened? So with that said, uh, get your questions ready. Uh, we'll start with David and then try to move to the more vivid color slides. Thank you, Mike. 
I'm with the Wall Street Journal editorial page in Hong Kong. It's, uh, it's, it's very nice to be back in Washington uh, for a brief period of a, of a week or two, just in time, as it happens, to return from Asia and see uh, Japanese cherry blossoms <laughs> in frigid bloom, but, but mostly in bloom. It's especially nice, uh, I'm especially grateful to Hudson for putting this event together because the impression that my colleagues and I get in Hong Kong is that notwithstanding several days of prominent headlines last year, Washington is not watching this Hong Kong democracy issue closely, if at all. And Washington seems generally not to be paying attention to either the human rights and democracy issues or to the broader regional security issues, especially concerning Taiwan, that relate to this Hong Kong democracy issue. So I hope to, to shed some light on, on that range of issues and, and really to thank Hudson for putting together this, this event. To Mike Pillsbury, of course, uh, to Ken Weinstein, to Rachel Cox, and to everyone else for organizing because it does seem that these issues deserve more attention in Washington and in other Western capitals than they've received. I arrived in Hong Kong with the Wall Street Journal editorial page about two years ago, uh, soon after the Occupy Central idea had been proposed by a Hong Kong University law professor in the Hong Kong Economic Journal. That idea was that the Democrats of Hong Kong should resort to mass civil disobedience if Beijing continued denying democracy to Hong Kong in violation of promises that Beijing, that the central government of China had made over many years. When that idea was proposed in January 2013 in this magazine, I don't think anyone expected it to take fire in the way that it did. But in the 18 months that followed, it gained an enormous amount of currency among a wide range of Hong Kong political life, democratic activist life, from lawmakers to professors and activists and students and others. And it was that uh, ferment, along with Beijing's continued policy of breaking its promises, that resulted in late September in the protests that briefly gathered international headlines, lasted 79 days, and have had a major effect on Hong Kong politics and also on some regional political and security dynamics. I was privileged to, to be in Hong Kong and to be reporting on those protests across the 79 days to get to know many of the leaders among the student leadership and the, the professors and others who were who had developed the ideas and, and some of the organizing tactics and principles of this movement. It was striking to be able to see the speeches delivered from a podium on an occupied highway that runs right along the local government headquarters, speeches delivered by amazingly articulate 17, 18, 24 year old student leaders to very large crowds. There were also days of quiet during the 79 days when police and protesters kept their distance, when the main activity was things like the students building along that same highway study halls for themselves, you know, out of wood and tarp with computers, plentiful Wi-Fi. I mean, as a logistical matter, it was amazing to see how they equipped themselves with cell phone and computer charging stations. I mean, a real 21st century kind of consideration, but they had trucks that existed essentially as generators. They ran power strips out of them, and it helped drive this movement. There were also, of course, uh, across the 79 days of reporting, uh, some eyewitness moments of a, of a much less uh, charming variety. Uh, typically, in the middle of the night, it was 3 a.m. or 6 a.m., when police with uh, batons and pepper spray and assorted other helmets and shields and the like would forcefully clear a park or a street corner uh, and would, would often be quite rough in the process. Seeing that that rhythm of the protest, seeing finally it, uh, it in somewhat miraculous fashion settle uh, and, um, and break apart peacefully and in an orderly way in early December was, was extremely interesting. And the main, uh, it was striking throughout 
to see the discipline and organization and restraint of the movement. Like any mass political movement, it had its difficulties and shortcomings. So there were rivalries among student leaders and coordination among different student groups was sometimes difficult. There were difficulties coordinating among the different locations of the protest. There were three sites, one by the government headquarters and two in shopping districts elsewhere. So coordination among them was sometimes difficult. And there were moments when the movement felt a bit like the, that proverbial dog that chases and chases and finally catches the bus and then wonders, what do I do with a bus? <laughs> the movement had to figure out what to do tactically, how to think about withdrawal, how to move forward. It had some of these difficulties and it even had some false starts. But overall, it had amazing organization, discipline, unity of purpose, commitment to nonviolence for a mass political movement. I mean, we've seen from just in recent years, from Cairo to Occupy Wall Street and elsewhere, the amazing difficulty of keeping mass political movements <coughs> peaceful and essentially unified. Hong Kong accomplished that. And they did it with overwhelmingly student leadership under the shadow of the world's strongest authoritarian government and the Chinese military. And it was quite, it was quite a display. Uh, in doing so, they showed to that government and to everyone else that Hong Kongers are more committed to preserving their liberalism, their autonomy, their free institutions, free press, rule of law, academic freedom, and the like, than almost anyone gave them credit for. And they showed to the government that unless the government is willing to compromise on the system of electing the leader of the city and allow the people of Hong Kong to actually choose their own leaders as they've been promised, then Hong Kong might have restive and dysfunctional politics for generations to come, led in many ways by the very young student pro-democracy leaders who came to prominence in this 79 days. The main point I want to make today is that all of this story of Hong Kong's democracy movement is of enormous significance not only to the 7.2 million people of Hong Kong, but to China, to all Asia, to the United States, and to all of us. And if you'll indulge me, there's a, uh, a convenient shorthand for thinking through the range of issues that both motivated the protests and in some ways point to what will come of them. And it's a, a shorthand that derives from an amazing, astounding series of coincidences <laughs> that folks in Hong Kong are attuned to and have pointed out. And they center on the number 689, or 689. Through this series of coincidences, the number 689 tells us both about the democracy movement of past, present, and future, and about the broader implications. So this 689 was a number that I heard and saw constantly in the streets during the protest, because it is the preferred nickname used by the Democrats to name the leader of Hong Kong, the chief executive C.Y. Lung. It's C.Y. Lung's nickname because in 2012, C.Y. Lung, this pro-Beijing Hong Kong official, rose to the city's top job because he won a majority of the votes of a 1,200 person nominating committee stacked with pro-Beijing loyalists in Hong Kong who, of course, are not accountable to the 7.2 million people of Hong Kong. He won a majority of 689. So the students call him by this name as a slur to highlight his illegitimacy, that his mandate only comes from this essentially corrupt and rigged system. And yet there are several layers that make this nickname so much more potent and uh, in some ways even vulgar and politically charged than merely a reference to this nominating committee. It is also, just to start with the lighter content, it happens to be that 689 is a vulgar Cantonese double entendre that 
ridicules C.Y. Lung's manhood. And this is a family organization. We'll have to leave it at that. But if there are Cantonese speakers in the room or if folks have friends and family uh, who speak Cantonese, you might ask them what the pun is made of 689 in, in Cantonese. Much more seriously, the number 689 evokes the Tiananmen Square massacre of June 1989. And that is the first of several astounding coincidences concerning this number. You would think that if a small group of pro-Beijing loyalists are rigging an election, they might come up with a vote count that does not <laughs> connect to the darkest moment in recent Chinese history. And yet, you know, there we have it. 689 votes is the supposed mandate of the pro-Beijing leader of Hong Kong. Because the 6 is the month of June and 89 is 1989. Exactly. So in Chinese, when you say the Tiananmen incident, you just say 689. Right. So it's an automatic pun in, in Chinese. It's an automatic pun, and mm. it's in Hong Kong, it is the most, Hong Kong is the world's center of Tiananmen remembrance. It's where a million people marched twice in solidarity with the students of Beijing in May and June 1989. It's the only place in China where it is uh, allowed to publicly remember the Tiananmen Square Massacre, mm -hmm. which happens every year in Hong Kong, in Victoria Park, in June. So these numbers are, are both references to the historical event, but in Hong Kong especially, they are as powerful and potent as it gets because the China of June 1989 is what the Hong Kongers are trying to prevent from coming to them mm -hmm. in Hong Kong. They are fighting for democracy in order to hold on to the liberal institutions, free press, free universities, independent judiciary that separate Hong Kong from mainland China. They separate Hong Kong from the China of Tiananmen, and the Hong Kong protest movement does not want Tiananmen Square to come to their city. So this number 689 is deeply evocative of, in many ways, the central things that drive this protest movement. There is also, by astounding coincidence, uh, a blogger pointed out that the, uh, well, well, we'll stick to a different one first, a, a little numerology for us. Uh, in typical Hong Kong fashion, it's a financial center, it's a city basically of banks and shopping malls, although it has its charms if you look hard enough. There was a sign during the protest above a Citibank branch, of course, that pointed out that six plus eight plus nine equals 23. And the number 23 in Hong Kong politics evokes the draconian anti-subversion legislation known as Article 23, which was proposed about 10 years ago and in many ways launched and fueled the modern democracy movement that exists in Hong Kong today. There were mass protests in the street in the summer of 2003 that forced the government to withdraw this proposed legislation, which would have run the risk of criminalizing a broad swath of political speech. So it put the city up in arms. The government withdrew it. The chief executive at the time resigned over this public outcry. And that number remains potent in Hong Kong politics. I wrote in October that Article 23 would be a symbol for all of us watching Hong Kong politics as to how the government responds to the protests. If Article 23 comes back into the discussion as a result of the protests, because the government says these misbehaving youth in Hong Kong need to be essentially put in their place and kept under control by what the Chinese government calls national security legislation, it would signal to the world that the government response to the protest movement is not conciliation and compromise, but it's a further hard line. And unfortunately, we're now several months out from the protests, and in fact, Article 23 is back being discussed increasingly by local government figures, former government offici officials from Hong Kong and from Beijing, and Article 23 is, is back. And so this 6 plus 8 plus 9, again, is uh, part of what fueled the protests and part of what we're now seeing I in the political fallout from them. The final way in which this number echoes uh, almost absurdly, except it happens to, to, to be the case, amazingly enough, a blogger pointed out that in 2012, 
the same year that C.Y. Lung won this rigged small committee election with 689 votes in Hong Kong, Taiwan had a presidential election. And the Taiwanese president, Ma ying Zhou, won re-election to the Taiwanese presidency with 6.89 million votes. <laughs> so by you know, a crazy, astounding coincidence, it evokes the fact that Taiwan has a real democracy with real free elections, with the peaceful transfer of power from one party to the next and back again. And it's the only portion of greater China where there is real self-government. And that exists in the Hong Kong imagination not only as a kind of, of aspiration, but the Chinese government has linked Hong Kong and Taiwan for decades. In the early 1980s, when the Chinese government was uh, negotiating with the British to get Hong Kong sovereignty, the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping created a framework that he called One Country, Two Systems, which he said would allow Hong Kong to come to, under Chinese sovereignty while maintaining its liberalism. He explicitly said that system applied to Hong Kong was meant to be a model for Taiwan. It was to show the way that Taiwan, as the Chinese see it, would unify peacefully with mainland China, would come under the sovereignty of the Beijing government, and would be satisfied that it got promises from Beijing that it'll maintain its high degree of autonomy and relatively liberal institutions. The problem is now, Taiwan looks at Hong Kong and sees that China does not honor its promises. It especially doesn't honor its promises in the area of liberalism, self-government, and autonomy. And so the Hong Kong example, which exploded last year, is a major warning sign to Taiwan. It helps explain why the overwhelming majority of Taiwanese support at least the continuation of their status quo, where they govern themselves separate from the Beijing government. And overwhelming numbers of Taiwanese tell pollsters all the time that they have no taste for unifying with China as long as the Beijing government is authoritarian. The problem is, among other things, the Beijing government is getting increasingly impatient with the fact that Taiwan remains self-governing. And so while Hong Kong fuels Taiwanese desire to stay separate, the Beijing government is suggesting that it's increasingly feeling urgent that there needs to be what they call a settlement of the political issue. So senior officials and retired generals from the Chinese military regularly remind that the Chinese military has never, uh, has never put away the option of gaining Taiwan by force. And the current Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, said in 2013, he said, these issues, the political settlement of the Taiwan issue that has been a major issue, of course, for China since 1949, these issues cannot be passed on from generation to generation. That is potentially, from Beijing, a warning of real tension to come across the Taiwan Strait. Because the people of Taiwan do not want voluntarily to unify with an authoritarian China, but that authoritarian China is increasingly saying, it's got to happen. And China has at its disposal, potentially, very significant economic tools, and of course military tools, to try to coerce and intimidate the Taiwanese to do what they want. If China chooses to use those tools in the months and years to come, which it might do, especially since a year from now, Taiwan will have an election that will likely put into office the opposition party that has much more tense relations with Beijing than the current ruling party, which has ruled since 2008. If Beijing chooses to respond to things like the election of the opposition by using its economic and military tools of coercion, we could really see the Taiwan Strait become again one of the most dangerous, if not the most dangerous flashpoints in the world. And that's a matter of intense, that ought to be of intense concern to US defense planners and policymakers. And it's a way in which this Hong Kong story is not simply a story of human rights and democracy that should only concern people with a taste for human rights and democracy and shouldn't concern people focused on real politic and you know statesman cold calculations the taiwan angle demonstrates that the hong kong democracy issue relates directly to 
not only the fate of liberalism and self-government and autonomy in Hong Kong, but broader regional security issues that can be very dangerous. Because a Chinese government that is unwilling to compromise in Hong Kong is unlikely to be willing to compromise toward Taiwan either. And that's dangerous over there, and it's dangerous potentially for US security concerns as well. I'll leave it there for Thank now. you. Those are several major legacies, I would say, of the movement that you've spelled out. But I'm surprised, just while Libby Leo is getting ready, uh, I'm surprised one thing you left out. Um, the, the source of friction between the US and China that the Hong Kong student protest movement seems to have caused. And I say that because of two things. One is in the Chinese media, uh, there were numerous allegations some would call them slander, of the U.S. government. That these students are not acting alone. Yeah. This is Uncle Sam back in Washington, D.C., has inst instigated this and actually <coughs> finances it. And then there were some, some conspiracy theory stories about how either the National Endowment for Democracy or U.S. officials in our large consulate in Hong Kong were actually directing the whole thing. And that led, perhaps, that's the reason President Obama, when he was in Beijing in November, uh, said at a press conference, we don't take sides in Hong Kong. I remember it very vividly, thinking, well, gee, I thought you could at least be in favor of democracy. But no, he said, we don't take sides in Hong Kong. We just want a peaceful resolution. So do you see the Hong Kong, based on your on-the-ground experience in Hong Kong, did you get a sense of friction between Beijing and Washington over this uh, charge that the American government is somehow instigating the students? Or is that just something Beijing talks about that nobody in Hong Kong was sensitive to? It, it wasn't so much an issue on the street because the charge that the protests were organized by Washington is, is so fanciful and so mm -hmm. disconnected to reality that on the street where the reality of the, of the politics and of the movement is the issue, that debate didn't apply diplomatically mm -hmm. and in the newspapers and when the foreign ministry and other spokesmen of the Chinese government would speak, it was a major issue. So mm -hmm. this was a major issue on the front page of People's Daily during the height of the protests. It was a theme that the local Hong Kong Chinese uh, pro-Beijing newspapers like Takong Pao and Wenwei Po and in English the China Daily promoted mm -hmm. regularly this idea that Hong Kong is a color revolution akin to the post-Soviet color revolutions in places like Ukraine 10 years ago. They pushed it very hard, but they had a great difficulty making the charge stick because it was so disconnected from reality. Uh, C.Y. Lung uh, brought in uh, several foreign reporters one day, and we asked him, uh, can you substantiate this charge that you and others are making about American somehow involvement in the local protests? And he refused to give details. He said to us, look, I've said it. It's real. I quote, I didn't hear it in a tea house. Uh -huh. He said, but he he offered no evidence, and the thin evidence, like things like National Endowment for Democracy funds, is uh, is a is a rather poor case. As, as you said, mm -hmm. the U.S. government actually is on record back to the 1992 Hong Kong Policy Act supporting the transition to democracy in Hong Kong. We do take a side as a U.S. government in that sense, and yet during the actual event. U.S. officials were kind of tripping over themselves to show actually we're not involved, we're not even interested. And we can argue about whether that was a, a wise choice, but it was the fairly consistent and clear position all the way from the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong to President Obama visiting Beijing and making mm -hmm. the statement that you cited. That we don't take sides. Okay, Libby, let's see if we can dim the lights a little bit uh, so everybody can see the photos, and I hope the camera can catch them too. We'll try to put them on the website sure, I'll of give Hudson you a Institute. Later. Um, first of all, I want to agree with everything David said. We could not be in more accord in, in f terms of our analysis and our opinion, and um, also to our gratitude for having this important event. Um, I agree. Not enough has been said about it in Washington, and it really needs to be. I, I do want to add something to um, the statement about the U.S. position. The Congress did come out and take a position in support of the universal suffrage movement. So. Um, 
I would like to do a shout out to the Hill for speaking out for universal suffrage. You want to mention anybody by name or just well, the entire Congress? No, the first, uh, I will say the first press release that we saw was from Leahy and Wicker, mm -hmm. and um, followed quickly by Roger Wicker, Republican, and Pat Leahy, Democrat. then the president pro tem on the Democratic side. Correct. Right? So it was a bipartisan It was a bipartisan um, statement, and it was quickly followed by a bipartisan letter to the White House, by signed by, I think, 20 members of the Hill Senate and House. So mm -hmm. um, this is my recollection. It's a little bit late. Now, because it's been a while, I put together a bunch of visual aids to try to help refresh our recollection about you know, what the 79 days was. Um, these are predominantly photos that I stole from Twitter. So I do not have <laughs> rights to them. Maybe stole isn't quite the right word you okay. mean. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm a huge fan of Twitter. I think it's the most amazing crowdsourcing of news ever. Maybe I should say Radio Free Asia <laughs> is a private, nonprofit corporation. We are a grantee from the US Congress. Our job is to provide news and information to closed societies in Asia where they don't have access to free press, free discussion, free expression, or free association. So we um, try to fill in the gap. So the notion that the protests are for the purpose of supporting universal suffrage is critical um, when you talk about the dynamics of the information war that's going on over this um, 79 days. In China, uh, we've seen over the, the past you know, at least decade, one of the most effective tactics of the Chinese Communist Party is to um, elicit an enormously virulent um, uber-nationalist um, streak within Chinese ethnic people, both within China and abroad. Um, I have personal experience with this um, because my parents left China in 1949 um, because of this government. And when the Tibetan uprising occurred, which Radio Free Asia broke and covered the news, my father told me with firmness that it was the CIA who was behind it. And I assured him that it was not, that we had covered this for eight years before it finally blew up. But um, so the Chinese use the notion of independence, OK? This is the word that is a hot flash button in China to unify the national sentiment against whoever is seeking independence from mother China. Um, so that's why universal suffrage is important. Here are some um, visuals of the demonstration. You can see that there's like study stations and it's, it's all very unique. I don't think we've ever seen anything like this. It was a very well organized. Wow. Um, there was messaging with sim symbology and um, protest art, which has long, long tails in, in terms of future protests everywhere. So. Um, I think that we went over why there was a protest. You know, basically it was because of the basic law. There is supposed to be universal suffrage by 2017. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. I don't think any of us are going to hold our breath. So um, the issue came to a head, and you know, we had the Occupy movement, which Occupy movement is like pseudonym or whatever for the pro-universal suffrage and democracy movement in Hong Kong. So here are the, some of the things that were very much alive during the 79 days. Um, here's a timeline you know, of all the events that happened. Um, in terms of Radio Free Asia, our biggest focus was how are we going to break the blockade of silence onto the mainland? And how are we going to um, find truth in the messaging that was going on? And it was a, a very, very tough thing, and I think that um, the great long leg of press freedom in this is that there was the ability through both media, social media, um, foreign media, and um, internet freedom technology to have an engagement both online and with the students in Hong Kong, with the people in Hong Kong, and actually world over. So. Um, what is GFW? GFW is the Great Firewall of China. The Great Firewall of China. And so, it did all these things. Yes, and they shut, shut down, down Twitter, Twitter, they shut down Facebook, they shut down Instagram, they um, blocked bunches of forbidden words, and it was ongoing. Um, so they can do this oh, to Hong Kong. 
itself. No, they did it. Or, well, they can do it in Hong Kong to some degree. Well, uh, okay, so I don't want to get into minutia, but okay. the issue in Hong Kong is self-censorship. And it's because of the um, control of the ad revenue that the mm -hmm. Chinese government and pro-China corporations have. I mean, David probably knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, this visual, which probably is not very family correct, um, is a Twitter photo of a very famous activist poet in China. And he posted this and he went to jail. But I thought that it was, it's evocative of what really pisses China off. He has the umbrella, mm -hmm. he has the Taiwan flag, and he has an expression of his feelings towards them. That is blurred out there. <laughs> okay, here is a um, graph that, of the censorship on the Weibo. And you can see that when the Hong Kong protests began, the spike of censored posts just, you know, went skyrocketing. Now, at the same time as they were blocking information of going back to the mainland, they were also doing a lot of um, messaging, as David points out. And their messaging towards the students in Hong Kong were like, nobody supports you. This whole thing is Western influences. It's mm -hmm. always the CIA. I don't know why it's always the CIA. Um, everything on TV was on um, seven second delay, even English news, which is not usual. In China, they often block Chinese language news programs and anything covering anything that is objectionable. But in this case, they also put all of the English stuff on seven second delay so that they could bleep out anything that related to the Hong Kong um, movement in any way that was pos positive. Um, we did see something very interesting, which was when the government did choose to engage in violence, it actually, and, um, brought the protesters together. As David said, these, this was a truly civic um, demonstration. It was people from everywhere coming together. And so there was a non-coordination, but it was so organic mm -hmm. that you know that had a profound impact. And when you attack one, you attack all. So um, the violence actually did help. Um, there were several censorship countermeasures that we engaged in, which were effective, and it's um, a fantastic thing for us to be able to be effective against the Great Firewall because, you know, what Great Firewall is probably the, the most effective censorship online in, on the earth. I mean, they're really, really good. So at that time, um, these are some of the things that were done. For instance, um, I said that Twitter was blocked, mm -hmm. and more than that, that there were lots and lots of hashtags that were blocked, and we ran on the satellite TV live tweet decks of the four most forbidden words at any given time on Twitter, so that anybody in the mainland could see what they were being blocked from at any given time, and it was all done in real time. And um, we're actually still doing this in Tibetan and in Uyghur uh, for China. The other thing was the messaging that, you know, you're all alone, nobody supports you. Um, there was worldwide solidarity for the Hong Kong students. And we wanted them to know that. We wanted the people in China to know that. And so whenever something came up, you know, around the world where people stood up and said, yes, we are with the students on universal suffrage, we piped that back in so that there could be an engagement stream. And that was, you know, to counter the messaging that they were on their own and nobody, everyone hated them. Um, we also live streamed on satellite TV um, using the Apple Daily stream so that all the stuff that was blocked out on the mainland could get in. Um, the Chinese do not yet jam our satellite feed. Um, here are some of the um, actions and reactions that we thought were particularly effective. Um, imagine how brave these people were, the Occupy Great Wall people, they decided that they were going to do a solidarity event on the Great Wall. I mean, that's profoundly courageous in my view. And then the... So you're showing a demonstration inside China yes. on the Great Wall yes. that Radio Free Asia covers and then beams, if you will, yes. throughout mainland China. Yes. This is part of the mission of Radio Free Correct. Asia. Our to mission, sort of serve yes. as a free broadcasting station to listeners in China. Exactly. So this is like a double play on words for the word Great Wall. It's, you're, yes. you're breaking the Chinese Great Wall. You. <laughs> yes. You're breaking the Great Wall censorship system with your own message about a Great Wall protest, exactly. which in, term is, in, term, in terms of what happened back in Hong Kong 
is otherwise would not be known? Is that the idea? It would not be known very well inside China. Well, I mean, um, to be fair, I don't know that this was known to a vast amount of people, but mm -hmm. I do know that we got the information in. Mm -hmm. And we know that because we have a feedback loop, right? So more people did call and show calls to us and said they, they had no idea what was going on in Hong Kong except they saw it on TV, they read our tweet deck, they saw these mm -hmm. images. So what we're trying to do is break basically the blockade of silence and to counter the messaging that's coming out of Beijing. But if I'm a Chinese nationalist in Beijing, mm -hmm. I know Radio Free Asia is funded by the U.S. Congress. Uh -huh. It's U.S. government money. Uh -huh. So you are doing things inside China to advertise the democracy movement. So you are kind of, you Radio Free Asia, you Libby Liu, you actually are doing things inside China to interfere politically. Um, but, you have, but the law, the American law says you have to do that. There's a law that sets up Radio Free Asia, right? That's correct, and uh, thank God there's a law for that because um, Nothing is more important um, to freedom than information and mm -hmm. the ability to speak. And um, I think that that is so profound and seen every day, including in the long tail after the 79 days with the Chinese messaging and the censorship and the blockage. I mean, when we were talking about um, the power of the press, the Chinese are afraid. I mean, they could say mm -hmm. that the thing that happened in the 79 days was meaningless, but if it was meaningless, then why did they do all of this? And mm -hmm. why do they continually to message that the umbrella revolution is seeking independence to rile up the nationalists, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. it was meaningless, then nobody would have to do anything. So we know that it's not from their own um, discussions. Mm -hmm. So um, here's some examples of the feedback loop. Um, Twitter is blocked, but you know, through internet circumvention technology, lots and lots of people, millions and millions of people have access to the blocked sites and blocked information. And um, part of the feedback loop is we put information out there and then celebrity bloggers will retweet these things. Here's an example. That was the first post on the Lenin Wall in Hong Kong. Hu Jia reposted it. He has 60,000 followers. His 60,000 followers will retweet it, and you know you see the, how the proliferation goes. Um, this is an effective strategy, in our view, of how to get information out. Um, I thought this was incredibly fun. Um, some group put together this thing called Stand By You, which was right above the Lenin Wall in Hong Kong. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. And anybody around the world could go online and post a shout out to the students. And they would be posted there visually. It's a huge visual display mm -hmm. for everybody in sight. So the feedback loop to provide true views. I mean, this is like you online in wherever, mm -hmm. Milwaukee, saying, yeah, I'm with you. China can't do anything about that. So we love the power of information. Um, this is a slide about um, the lessons of the elements of the protest that we thought were particularly powerful. I'm, I'm going to just skate by that <laughs> since... No, but you, wait a minute. This could be quite important in terms of the legacy of the... Of it the is the legacy. So you're drawing lessons for anybody in China who has access Maybe. to this material, they can see, aha, this is how a student movement could be or orchestrated and in China if the government did not bring out the military and the police and crack down. Yeah, and um, actually not just limited to China. We think it's um, useful for pro-democracy people all over the world. Aha, uh -huh. I see, I'm I see. just suggesting. Not just China. No, I mean, I think that they're really, they were incredibly innovative and um, their tactics could be reused all over the place. I mean, the art of protest was profound, and you know, just the quality of the art um, has given it long legs all over the world. You know, it's like using humor in cartoons is, is exactly. part of it, right? Satire, <laughs> sure. I don't know if everybody can see the other slide Libby Leo put up. It's got uh, best practices. Oh yes, I'm I take sorry. it that means best practices to be an effective democratic protester. Um, uh, yes, I, I, do, <laughs> I would say that although I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. So these are some of the examples of the protest art. I mean, it was profound. I have probably 500 images of the protest art, which David had the ability to see. I mean, I can't tell you how much I envy you for having been there on the ground. And, and there were organizations that, that archived it, and, and they, they took, you know, they laminated posters that were on the street. They took this enormous uh, wooden figure of a man holding an umbrella that 
people said was a reference back to the goddess of democracy, which was the model Statue of Liberty brought out at Tiananmen in 1989. These things uh, are already in some cases and will be in museums, and I think there are websites dedicated to this. It is an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable. collection of art. And it's so evocative and powerful, and you know, in future potential demonstrations for democracy around the world, they could be you know, reused. And you know, everybody will know what they stand for, which is universal suffrage. Um, Does this stay online now, Libby? If somebody wants to Google t this afternoon and get these slides, how would they well, do Well, um, this particular presentation will be available through Hudson because okay. I'm going to give you the Prezi link and it will be alive forever. So if anybody Thank wants you. to see it, <laughs> you can. But you know, if you go to Twitter and look up the um, Occupy Central, Occupy Hong Kong, then you're going to get a lot of these images. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I pulled them from everywhere I could find them because I'm so fascinated by the effectiveness of the visual display that occurred there. So here are some of the things that, you know, there was symbology, the social media was incredibly important there. Um, the Lenin Wall was just a powerful way to engage humans in mm -hmm. actively <coughs> supporting the movement. Um, there were signals which I thought were hysterical. Um, Happy Birthday was a song that you know meant do not become violent in the face of the blue ribbon people, which were the opposition. Mm -hmm. You know, because there was a very strong effort to keep the whole thing nonviolent, as David points out. So, I mean, all of this is really, really powerful. Here's. Um, you know, here's a picture that somebody tweeted that actually it was somebody's birthday, so it wasn't a blue ribbon birthday singing, it was actually <laughs> somebody's birthday. It was this little boy's birthday that you can see there. Does one of your photos show David's point about the 689? <laughs> Um, actually, I, I have Rome, an entire slideshow of 689, which I did not bring because I didn't know we were going to get to hear the, I mean, I think that that's unbelievable, the 689 thing. Um, there was unity in defying the censorship. I don't know if um, anybody recalls this, but there was a time when the thugs surrounded Apple Daily headquarters because they did not want it, Apple Daily to be able to publish. So um, the, the next day, all of these Apple Daily employees and I think supporters um, you know this. They all took this huge picture where they were holding up the Apple Daily newspaper, and you know it went viral worldwide. And um, I think it's incredibly important for we as a world to know that we are all one humanity that needs to support freedom. I mean, that's my personal view. Now, Radio Free Asia has a huge global internet freedom program. Um, we fund edge technology that helps people in closed societies reach the internet, you know, have privacy, anonymity, so they can't be trapped by their governments and persecuted for um, these things. Um, the reason it was particularly important to me to house the internet freedom technology program is during the Saffron Revolution, in the days following it, an enormous percentage of our sources inside Burma were hauled up and sent to insane prison with transcripts of phone calls that they made to Radio Free Asia. Mm. And that was a, um, it's a, it remains a very, very painful lesson. And so now we do whatever we can so that people inside closed societies can communicate with each other and with the um, community online as a whole as safely as possible. And this was um, profoundly important during the Umbrella Revolution, the 79 days. Um, what you'll see is that, oh good, I did, I did do this. Uh, Fire Chat was a mesh network thing that allows people to have internet access to each other, created for some crazy f music festival. And um, what happened is that during the Umbrella movement, um, probably not for bad reasons, just because of the overload of the internet, it got shut down, it was erratic, it was not you know, easy for people to talk to each other, and it was important for the organizers to be able to co coordinate with each other. So Fire Chat had an instantaneous mesh set up in mm. Umbrella Movement, and it allowed everybody to keep in touch. So um, this is an example of how internet freedom technology works. Red Phone is um, an app that allows you to have end-to-end -end secure encrypted phone calls. This was also used on the ground in Hong Kong. Um, so important, as I said, because you don't want the transcript of your phone call to someday put you in prison. Um, there, this is a technology for text messaging or SMSing on mobile to mobile. This is particularly key because now um, WhatsApp 
which is a 700 million strong, has built tech secure encryption technology on the back end. So <coughs> anybody that uses WhatsApp benefits from this security and they can't be monitored, surveilled, or you know, retaliated against. Now, just to I'm clarify, end with this. just to clarify though, you're you're saying that these are lessons Radio Free Asia learned from the Saffron <coughs> Revolution in Burma, where your sources were put in prison. It's just one and example. Transcripts of phone calls. You've learned a lot more how to do this better, and it was applied in Hong Kong. Is that yeah, correct? Yes, there were uh, many instances where internet circumvention technology were used in Hong Kong in a way that I think is very meaningful and that I wish would spread. And we saw that um, access tools mm -hmm. um, saw a huge spike on the mainland during mm -hmm. this censorship period. Mm -hmm. So that means there were a lot of people that were trying to get access to the information that they were being denied. And you know, that's internet freedom. And we think everybody should do their act as anything. So this is the slide that is about the long tail mm -hmm. of the 79 days. And it goes to the And there are uh, the four discussion. big circles on your slide. There are Hong four big Kong circles effect. on my slide. It's um, what's going on in Hong Kong now and in the future, um, beyond Hong Kong, um, Taiwan, and China. Um, because there's the Taiwan slide, there's the China slide, and then there's the world. And I think that um, we can assess the legacy of the Hong Kong mm -hmm. movement in its effect going on in all of these places. But, you know, that's all for the discussion that you want to lead, so. Well, you've even got Scottish referendum up there in one of your, yes, that's a I long do. way from Hong Kong, right? I to, do, Is I that do. really a direct part of um, the legacy? It was, it was so close in time, and I thought that it was, it's very meaningful because um, even though the Scottish referendum failed, mm -hmm. the fact that it was even there was meaningful. Mm -hmm. And um, democracy and uh, supporters from all these different movements, you know, the Tibetans and, you know, from Taiwan and all over the world went to Scotland for the referendum mm -hmm. to see if they could learn something. And I, it's a profound, I think, statement of the support globally for the notion of universal suffrage and peaceful protest in support of democracy. And that's why um, I put it on the slide. But, you know, we can talk about, we can go to questions now. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, give a visual reminder of what we all saw and learned. I think it's pretty good, don't you? It's great. It brings back nostalgic memories of what you actually saw I know, in person. I know, he was actually there. <laughs> You, you're probably going to have more opportunity coming up. That's what, that's what they say. <laughs> well, I thought we'd go to general questions um, pretty soon. I only have one question, really, to ask both of you. Um, I'm going to try to take the other side. There's uh, on the legacy and, and the democracy movement uh, in China and then worldwide. There are a number of articles. Uh, Carl Gershwin, the president of National Endowment for Democracy, has written one of them. Um, and there's been a conference that dictatorships and authoritarian regimes are getting better and better at suppressing democracy. That's kind of a simplified uh, version of their conclusion. That technology, police, uh, marketing techniques, there's a whole long list, are on the side of the authoritarian regimes. And therefore, on the democracy side, they recommend they're not panicking or they're not passive, but they're saying, number one, more money is needed uh, from the U.S. Congress and from other countries as well. Number two, they're saying better technology is going to be needed to overcome the advantages that the governments have to suppress, can, as you were pointing out, even communications among uh, students. And number three, they're implying in their articles that the enthusiasm uh, in America and around the world for democratic movements has go is going down. It's not a big deal like it used to be. So I wanted to ask you about these three things. It sounds like both of you are highlighting, you're on the other side. It's like bulls and bears in the stock market. The bears are saying no, democracy's uh, chances are going down. And it sounds like the two of you are more bullish that students can be unified, there can be a cause, even the use of numerology, uh, like 689 somehow works. Wh where do you stand on this, on the prospects for the legacy of this kind of student movement, let's say 10 years from now, we all get together in 2025. 
Will you be able to say, we told you so, student protests have broken out inside China and around the world, or will the more pessimistic people be right that not much is going to happen in terms of democracy promotion because the money doesn't seem to be there yet? David, you want to go first? Are you a sure. bull or a bear? <laughs> it's, it's an extremely interesting and, and it seems important debate. The, the corrective value of, of the argument that, that Mike alluded to, that authoritarian governments have gotten and are getting very good at using digital tools for their own purposes to undermine uh, opposition, to track and imprison, it's important and healthy to have that recognition serve as a corrective to some of the more uh, optimistic or even utopian arguments that were made in the earlier days of the internet that the internet would necessarily and almost immediately lead to you know the fall of authoritarian governments the mm -hmm. world over mm -hmm. so having this uh, kind of injecting this uh, degree of sobriety would seem to be extremely important because as as Mike alluded and, and as I gather Carl Gershman and other has, and others have argued that or earlier, more optimistic or, or utopian view could breed a certain complacency. Like, we have the internet, and it's only a matter of time. And cut it's, the budget. Right, and, there, and, there, and therefore, promotion programs. Right, pr you know, promotion programs, innovation around tech organizing and secrecy, these things aren't necessary. Mm -hmm. That would certainly seem not to be the case. And so the argument for maintaining this, uh, you know, for having U.S. funding for uh, internet freedom overseas for operations like Radio Free Asia and Voice of America and others that can uh, deliver real news in closed societies and have to do so increasingly through newer high-tech tools that is newer than shortwave radio, maintaining that is extremely important. In the broader term, if the question is, does the internet uh, make authoritarian governments on net better off and safer than uh, than they were before? Does it give them more advantage than it gives you know opposition activists and democratic activists? That's uh, it would seem to be a question that has to be answered in, in historical terms. Uh, it, I don't know the answer. I find it hard to believe though that authoritarian governments are sitting around thrilled and relaxed because of the internet. They continue to put dissidents in prison. Those are signs, I mean, the, the behaviors that China exercises with a person like Lu Xiaobo, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate who's been in prison now for something like five of an 11 year term because he wrote some essays promoting democracy. That is the behavior of a nervous government in Beijing. And it's the same behavior we see in Moscow and elsewhere across the world. I think that the behavior of these authoritarian governments is as good a proxy as we're going to have for how they feel. And they continue to act nervous, afraid, vulnerable, because they put literary theorists in prison in large numbers. So they don't act like the internet means they're secure forever. Uh, it would suggest that it means the internet does not mean that they're secure forever. Um, I agree. Um, I actually, I, I agree with Carl and um, the others that talk about how the internet is being used as a powerful weapon by the authoritarian regimes. Um, they have used deep pockets to purchase, you know, incredible tools that, you know, can block and can capture and can um, redirect traffic from anywhere they want. I mean, the technology works in both ways. And the fact that the authoritarian governments are not afraid to use it, that they have the money to buy it, they have the humans to implement it, means that it can be a powerful weapon of suppression. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. hope is not lost because the human spirit wants to be free. And because of that, the innovation on internet circumvention technology is just limitless. I mean, one of the... Um, reports that we uh, sponsored about three years ago is about a notion called collateral freedom. And collateral go, Collateral freedom. freedom. And it goes like this. In China, the economy is so important to China that they have to have the internet, right? And they have to have avenues on the internet that banks can use securely, or they cannot conduct business on the internet. So um, 
very creative internet circumvention technologists inside China create tools that ride on the open legal um, internet systems that mm -hmm. China has to keep alive for their businesses to flourish. And we know that China's deathly afraid of any economic problem because, mm -hmm. you know, they've got this whole thing going where their um, citizens are happy because they have money. Now, um, he's absolutely correct. We need to be putting more money on the side of the freedom fighters because information is a threat to authoritarians, which inversely means it is important to freedom. And if we want to assist in any way, even a drop, I mean, at this point, we probably put all together our nation $50 million in total towards internet circumvention technology. Five zero million, five 50 zero million? Five zero point five mm -hmm. million, and that Out is Out of our $17 trillion economy. Exactly. And think about <laughs> how much China, Russia, Iran, I mean, they put into blocking, surveilling, and yeah. monitoring their internet. There was a number for China of $12 billion for what they call Dui Wai Xuanzhuan. Exactly. External propaganda efforts. That, so if you're that, saying 50 million is the American total against 12 billion for China, and you're not mentioning Iran. I mean, we're all thinking about Iran these days. Exactly. There were there was a history of student protests in Iran as well. Do Iranian students have access to these kinds they of do. things? They do. Iranian students are um, using it very well. Um, the Iranian government is, you know, spending a lot of money and trying to get their own intranet going mm -hmm. so that they can try to suppress more of mm -hmm. this online um, activity. You know, a, a large focus of our internet freedom program is on Iran and the tools that can be used there. You know, there are mm -hmm. very powerful tools that we can see are being used a lot in Iran. And so it's the amazing thing about internet freedom tools is that it will proliferate organically. Mm -hmm. Like during the um, Arab Springs, we saw that huge spikes of users were using a tool called UltraSurf. Ultra surf. Ultra surf. <laughs> Ultra surf is a tool that was created for China, right? It is. It is um, created out of the persecuted Falun Gong movement, and they created an access tool to the blocked internet, and it was used in the Arab Springs, even though it was not translated into Arabic. You know, the activists have passed along the best practices of communications in the face of internet mm -hmm. blocking to each other. And it doesn't even matter if it's in your language mm. because they're so desperate to use it. So even though um, I think we are abysmally underfunded in these efforts on internet circumvention technology, mm -hmm. um, the power of the people and the will to find information and communicate with each other and be a community um, multiplies the effect. So that's not to say I don't agree that we should be investing a lot more in this, but um, that is to say I am optimistic. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that we are going to win. And you know, it's actually a great source of pride for me that the US is a leader in the development of the technology. So it sounds like it's the, the legacy of the Hong Kong student movement, these 79 days, is not just Hong Kong, and it's not even just China or Taiwan. No. It's a global uh, improvement in best practices for democracy movements, in part through Radio Free Asia, but also on their own. Yes, absolutely. They can learn from each other. That's fascinating. Thank you. I wanted to see now if anybody has any questions or we've answered, oh my God, that's like wow. 20, 25 questions. <laughs> What do you think? I'm looking at David. Well, you have any friends, we'll you have any friends in the audience, Libby, you want to call on? <laughs> no, I don't have any friends. How about here in the front row? We start out with the gentleman in the front row right here. You have a microphone? Yes, we yes. do. It's coming. It's about 10 feet behind you. There it is. You want to introduce yourself? And, yes, uh, of course. Uh, my name is Arnold Zeitlin, and I'm a visiting professor at Hong Kong U. Hmm. Ah. Uh, oh, he's here with things, you. I'm also a visiting <laughs> professor in Guangzhou. Uh, uh, one thing, uh, the basic law promises universal suffrage, but I believe, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the broadly representative nominating committee was always in the picture. So, I mean, the, 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 the talk of, uh, of a promise broken isn't exactly, I think, accurate. Uh, two, uh, my Guangzhou grandfather, father-in-law, <coughs> insist that Hong Kong has suffered economically since the Occupy 
movement. Uh, I think he's wrong, but maybe you can uh, uh, discuss that aspect of it. And uh, three, Joshua Wong will be 50 years old in 2047 when uh, Hong Kong reverts entirely to the mainland. Uh, not only Joshua Wong, but his old generation will be at that age. In other words, they'll be in a leadership position, uh, and I wonder if you could discuss the significance of that. You want both Libby and uh, David Absolutely. to answer? Okay. David? <laughs> uh, sure. So the, uh, the first question about the, the basic law and the, the promise uh, of democracy or not, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, brief. Essentially, the question is, uh, has, has Beijing broken promises, or does the relevant constitutional document, this basic law that was finished in 1990 and became the constitution of Hong Kong when Hong Kong became Chinese in 1997, does that allow, the, does that essentially give the Beijing government the mandate to impose this uh, Iran-style election system that they want to impose, whereby a Beijing loyal committee gets to choose the candidates who run for the top job, and then the public gets to vote one man, one vote for those limited candidates. It's a system that uh, the Hong Kong democracy leader, uh, Martin Lee, uh, said is allowing the public to choose between puppet A, puppet B, and puppet C. Exactly. But the defenders of that system, as, uh, as Mr. Zeitlin suggested, point to Article 45 of the Basic Law and say uh, that the, the, uh, the law basically says uh, the long-term goal of the political reform process is a gradual transition to democracy with universal suffrage uh, based on a, a broadly representative nominating committee. That is a perfect diplomatic statement that means everything and nothing and is entirely open to uh, debate. You can drive uh, tractors and sandpans right through it. It's, and it was exactly why, essentially, it was written that way. Uh, the, the Chinese with Hong Kongers and Brits involved were writing this basic law, and everyone wanted the flexibility to say it allows them to do roughly what they want. I think the difficulty that the defenders of the Beijing system have is that while the language of, of the law has this quite a bit of room for flexibility and might even bless what China is trying to impose. Over the years, Chinese officials made very clear promises on the subject of interpreting that provision, and they are walking back those promises systematically. So I don't, uh, I don't actually have the citation here, but in 1993, for example, uh, I believe it was the, the Beijing official with responsibility for Hong Kong Affairs wrote in the People's Daily that the process of democratic transition in Hong Kong is one of those things that fall under the, high, the quote, high degree of autonomy that is left to the Hong Kong people to decide for themselves. That is clearly no longer the operative position of the Beijing government. They have walked that promise back and they said, no, the structure of your transition to democracy will be dictated by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, which is what happened last August, and set off these protests. So on the basic law, uh, flexible language, the, the defenders of Beijing's system have uh, firmer ground. But in general, when Hong Kongers stand up and say, we've had promises broken to us, they can point to things like this authoritative People's Daily Comment and many others and say they're getting a raw deal. And, and they have a lot of grounding for that as well. Uh, on the others, perhaps more quickly, uh, the economic, uh, whether Occupy Central hurt the economy, um, I would basically punt on that. Uh, in, the immediate, uh, in the immediate months, it didn't. Now, more recently, like just this past week, there are numbers that actually, if you look on net from last year, the, mainland, the number of mainland Chinese traveling for tourism to Hong Kong and to do shopping did go down. That's a matter of debate. There's no question, though, that the kind of dire warnings that came from the Hong Kong government and from the Beijing government that a mass protest movement would be the end of the Hong Kong economy, that certainly is not the case. It wasn't the case if you looked at the stock market. It wasn't the case if you looked at the retail sales. It wasn't the case if you looked at tourist numbers. Uh, there was no catastrophe at all. There might have even been some improvements, but my sense is those numbers will have to shake out over time and we don't yet know the precise answer. 
uh, on Joshua Wong in 2047, I would just uh, basically agree with the thrust of the question if I understood it. The Hong Kong democracy movement is now led. Its most prominent and authoritative voices are 18 years old and 24 years old, and they're these high school and university student leaders. H one might think uh, that the idea that they have before them many, many decades of activism to come might be something that can concentrate the mind of the decision makers in Beijing, which is to say, if they don't come to a compromise that satisfies the Democrats of Hong Kong, these young leaders will be older leaders and older leaders and will cause uh, a real headache for the Beijing government and their youth might therefore be uh, a spur to Beijing to cut a deal so as to uh, save themselves from these decades of protests. But the government in Beijing might decide that uh, nothing is more concerning to them than actual self-government in Hong Kong. So even though they have decades to come of protest, they're not going to make a deal. That's, that's the decision before them. Um, I, I agree with David as usual because he's so smart. But um, the operative words are really broadly representative. Um, who is being broadly represented in the nominating committee? Um, that is the, what's up for debate. Um, in terms of the leadership of the Hong Kong movement, I think it's um, a long tail um, effect, which is incredibly important, is that you know once upon a time, uh, the Hong Kong youth were regarded as particularly materialistic um, and self-indulgent people, and um, they have really rallied and proven themselves to be not so, and to raise awareness so much so that scholarism is really leading the way in terms of conducting public lectures where you know housewives and all kinds of people from different segments of society are gaining awareness and education on all of these issues. I mean, it, it has a profound long-term effect, and I don't see that going away. It's true, just briefly, I was actually a bit generous to the, to the Beijing side of the argument when it comes to the law, because this word broadly representative, uh, there are international standards for what a representative system looks like. Uh, all sorts of scholars, Larry Diamond at Stanford, many others have done voluminous work on the subject and very good work. And uh, China, Hong Kong are signatories to international conventions, for example, that help define what a representative system looks like. And it ain't the system <laughs> that prevails with this Hong Kong right. nominating committee. This the Hong Kong it. nominating committee is basically a collection of um, business interest groups. There's you know, an accounting vote. There's a banker's vote. And this is essentially a very complex system that Beijing and its local allies in Hong Kong have set up to be everything other than Probably representative. Rep yeah. A representative system would respond to something like a public vote. And that's not the system that, that Beijing is, uh, is inviting. Can I just ask you both to clarify one thing? When we think about American policy, <clears throat> it's hard to not remember President Obama in Beijing in November saying we do not take sides. Is it your impression that the American government has taken a side on the issue of a broadly representative nominating committee according to the people of Hong Kong? Or does the American government say this is up to Beijing to interpret and if Beijing wishes to determine, you, uh, David, you use the word dictate, uh, what is broadly representative, um, is that a matter of concern to the U.S. government? Because one of our platitudes about China is they must uh, comply with international norms. That's the kind of China we want, sort of follows international law and international norms. It sounds like from these agreements you mentioned, David, there may be international norms about what is broadly representative. And if China in 93 said it's up to Hong Kong, that's another kind of norm. That's a promise China should abide by. Otherwise, it would be of concern to the US government. Do you have the impression that the US government has taken a stand on this? Or is it as President Obama said, we don't take sides in Hong Kong? Um, I, I really should not respond to this question, and I would say that um, it depends on what you consider the U.S. government to be. The White House and the President, I think, would be a key part of it, followed by the Congress. I would say that um, we have been remarkably silent. Okay. David? Uh, I, I would I would add, uh, Mike, to your question about norms. There, international norms are, are one thing. They can often be fuzzy and hard to pin down, certainly hard to... Uh, act on. Treaties are another thing. Mm -hmm. And actually, 
China's behavior, uh, China's policy toward Hong Kong is meant to be dictated by, among other things, the Sino-British Joint Declaration of 1984, which is a treaty. It was entered by the Chinese uh, at the United Nations even after the bilateral signing as a way of uh, the Chinese showing their seriousness. They actually went to capitals like Washington and said, uh, you know, please endorse this and essentially uh, hold us to it, which makes ironic now the Beijing government's insistence that any U.S. or British or other statements on the subject is somehow interference. When there's a matter of international treaty, uh, it's, 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 it's not interference, it's, it's merely following up on what is meant to be a, an honest promise. And one of the mm. ways in which Hong Kong most directly connects to broader American interests in peace and stability in Asia is that we want a China which not only follows norms, which are often hard to define, mm -hmm. but certainly follows its treaty promises. <laughs> and yet Hong Kong is an illustration that the Beijing government ha has very little concern for following its word on treaty promises, at least as concerns Hong Kong. And that, uh, it seems, ought to concern American policymakers and others. Okay, next. Uh, too many questions. The lady in the back, maybe? You look like you're ready to go and the microphone is next to you. No favoritism here in the question answer system. <laughs> I do have your book. Um, uh, okay, uh, my name is Iris Shaw of Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party. David, oh. it's always great to see you back in DC. Uh, so I do share your concern, David, that the way Beijing handles Hong Kong signals the inflexibility to Taiwan. And Xi, Xi Jinping also did say that the KMT, said to the KMT envoy, not the DPP, that the political disagreements cannot be passed on generations after generations. But would Taiwan straight really become a flashpoint if DPP wins the 2016? Um, so as the New Yorker's Evan uh, Osner said yesterday, if Xi Jinping uh, have to rank the areas where he wants things to be calm and stable, it would be the relationship with Taiwan. And the DPP's China Affairs Committee also issued an a official statement yesterday say, saying that if it comes back to power, the key is to maintaining the status quo, preserving cross-strait peace, and continuing the current uh, stable development. So would you reconsider a possibility of a cooperative relationship between the future DPP and Xi Jinping's administration in the context of the current dynamic of regional security? Thank you. I, I think that Americans and, and Chinese and, and, and Taiwanese and, and everyone else uh, would hope that uh, peace and calm and quiet and negotiated solutions to disputes prevails uh, between China and Taiwan today and a year from now if the opposition wins and two years from now and five and ten and fifty years uh, from now and the only uh, the concern is essentially that uh, of course Beijing has a vote a uh, very important vote in whether peace and calm prevail across the Taiwan Strait and there are reasons to uh, to be concerned the, the statement that you quoted and, the, and that I quoted from Xi Jinping uh, suggesting a certain impatience and maybe that, that he might favor uh, heightening the pressure on Taiwan in the event of an opposition victory or otherwise. Uh, I didn't see Evan Osnos's comment, but you know, if, if, if the argument is that for reasons of political consolidation at home, for reasons of uh, helping economic reform at home. The last thing Beijing needs is a risky war across the Taiwan Strait. I would certainly agree with that. But uh, history is full of, uh, of, of you know, states, uh, especially if, for example, they have uh, you know, they have a slowing economy at home and they feel that they need nationalist projects to earn the continued loyalty of their people to an authoritarian government. Those can be, unfortunately, recipes for real adventurous and dangerous foreign policy overseas. Certainly one hopes that doesn't apply to China in the remaining years of, of Xi Jinping's uh, rule. Um, but it would seem to be at least a reason for, uh, or it's, it's at least possible. And so uh, policymakers in Washington, uh, it would seem, ought to think through how that might look and what Washington might do to, uh, to help keep things stable and calm. 
Libby, you um, want to I, I say anything about the, in the opposition party best, on Taiwan? I, I think it's in everybody's best interest that it be peaceful and you know not something else. Um, it just is a matter of how much that peace costs. And I think that's really up to the Taiwan people. I would um, hope that they, you know, make those good choices. But um, the DPP, I think, is very rational and very reasonable. And, you know, there's no intention at all um, on their side of exacerbating a potentially awkward situation. So to be fair, we have to have the next question come from somebody in the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> anybody here from the... Pro-China. Come on. Or at least a pro-China question. Oh my God, no, not a single hand. <laughs> okay, how about any other question? Okay. I'm pointing at you, the microphone goes right here. Thank you. <coughs> my name is Hermes Levy. I'm a member of the Occupy Wall Street. And I was struck to see how uh, the movement are a lot of similarity what is happening in the Arab Spring what happened if Occupy movement what happened if Tiananmen what happened with this Occupy here in the US I think people don't didn't realize really the scope of what happened to the Occupy movement because it popped up in, in more than a thousand of city but in a matter of a uh, few months all our camps were closed you know, you, you, you heard about the pepper spray and all of, all of the stuff. What do you make about this uh, maybe exaggerated attack against the Occupy movement everywhere in the world? We have seen Occupy in Europe. They all closed. It looks like there's a, a cabal against the Occupy. And uh, what we say is, or what we want is to create a better world. What do you think that uh, who opposes mm -hmm. the creation of a better world? And what this slogan means really when we say better words of those in power why they feel why they feel threatened about creating a better world and could I add to your question did the <coughs> students did the students in Hong Kong adopt anything from the American Occupy Wall Street movement techniques or ideas or is it two totally separate things because sometimes in our press I see them Hong Kong students referred to as Occupy Central is a word they used were they consciously imitating or learning from the American Occupy Wall Street movement, or is it two different causes? Um, from my perspective, I think that it's a broader um, symbolism. Um, I don't think there was any active coordination between the various Occupy movements all over the world, but um, the notion of having um, organic, civic, um, civil disobedience that is peaceful and nonviolent. I think that that is what's connoted by the hashtag Occupy. I see. David? The, uh, it, it certainly appeared from Hong Kong there was very little in common between Occupy Wall Street uh, either in New York or elsewhere around the world and, and what was often called Occupy Central in Hong Kong. The, uh, I mentioned that article at the beginning that kicked off a lot of this public discussion of uh, doing a mass protest downtown that led to the movement. I believe that uh, article included the phrase Occupy Central, which of course was an allusion to Occupy Wall Street, which yes. in early 2013 was very recent history, but it was, uh, the similarities ended there. And, and it would seem actually that the movement in Hong Kong uh, complicated its message and complicated its ability to explain itself in audiences like this and in the West where Occupy Wall Street was very familiar by calling themselves Occupy Central. It was in some ways it was a convenient shorthand. It meant having a, a mass protest movement. But when it comes to uh, tactics beyond protests, uh, when it comes to their worldview, what they wanted to achieve through their protest, the divergence with Occupy Wall Street was, uh, was enormous. And uh, it was, I think, not a coincidence that when the protest movement uh, came to life. In other words, it was not simply this matter of public debate, but starting September 26 and then September 28 of last year with the tear gassing and the major crowds, the movement very quickly came to be called and to call itself the umbrella movement or the umbrella uprising, which was a reference to the fact that when the police started firing tear gas and pepper spray, 
uh, the students and the other protesters in Hong Kong, which is a very rainy place where umbrellas are often at hand, held up their umbrellas to protect themselves from the police, tear gas, and pepper spray. That became the icon, and I think the, the quickness and the kind of uh, fervor with which the movement came to name itself umbrella rather than Occupy was not an accident, because the Occupy Wall Street comparison was, was misleading. Uh, politically, economically, and otherwise. And, uh, and shedding that name was not just helpful as a matter of marketing, it was actually helpful as a matter of properly informing the viewing public uh, watching in Hong Kong and overseas. Thank you. Okay, next for the microphone. Uh, people way back in the back keep waving their hands. Go ahead. Thanks. Um Thanks for the forum. Uh, I've gained no uh, royal. Hey there, Mr. Fight. Your, I your no name. I can't, we uh, can't hear your Luckett, name up Steve, here. Luck it. I work and study here. I gained no royalties from um, from uh, from this book, but uh, for any audience member who's interested, uh, the Hundred Year Marathon, Mr. Pillberry, uh, is available on Amazon. So please. Uh, come <laughs> You're in. advertising my book. Uh, I Thank am, you. I am uh, <laughs> proudly. Um, and to that end, how does um, how does the principle of uh, uh, one state, two systems? figure into the 100-year marathon? And that, that question is specifically for you, Mr. Pillsbury. For me? Yes. No, but I'm just the moderator. Oh, so yeah. I'm, not, I'm not allowed <laughs> to become the center of attention. It's, I have no objection. I, I defer <laughs> <laughs> completely. Well, the Chinese strategy for the 100-year marathon, they've made very clear. It certainly involves a unified China. So that Taiwan and Hong Kong have to be working together with the rest of China and not be, as Libby pointed out, to have this evil word independence put on. So I would say from the Chinese point of view of the long term, the 100 year marathon, they've really got to have Hong Kong uh, be supportive and cooperative. It's, it's part of their strategy, which is why I think you found the Chinese not using force in Hong Kong and why they're very proud that the Chinese military, which has a unit, a base in Hong Kong, it didn't come out. What, what, there weren't uh, intimidation patrols or anything. So this is the, the theme of the 100-year marathon. And I thank you for advertising my book. <laughs> OK, next question for, for David and Libby. OK, right here. Yeah, I think the Chinese Embassy and New China News I Agency to do a, come today. Um, my name is Rosemary Reed, and I want to do a parallel thinking. I was listening to the internet um, connected to activity, and I thought about Ferguson here in the United States, uh, that the students did a very good job of getting around the country. There's a signs all over saying Black Lives Matter, and they did it through the internet and whatever. Phenomenal. Um, and also, I was thinking with voter rep uh, repression that's going to be coming up in the next election. How do you feel? Do you have any kind of thoughts about China and America and, and different states uh, during that kind of suppression that's going to need public support or democratic focus support? Uh, I, I think that you point out correctly that um, social media has been used incredibly effectively um, for unity of um, messaging and you know people finding um, compatriots around the world, in, I mean, around the country in this nation, um, I am not aware of um, actual internet blockage or blackouts that are intentionally done by our government. And so it's a, a little bit of a different animal. Um, I don't expect that to happen um, in this nation. I would hope not, knock on wood. Um, but uh, your question as to the use of um, internet technology to, um, you know, unify people that have similar views. I think that it, the Ferguson example is a great one. Um, I thought that the um, various demonstrations that were held all over, you know, not just the U.S., but, you know, in Canada and elsewhere with hashtag Black Lives Matter, um, it was effectively used. And it, um, it was a very different situation than what's going on in Hong Kong and China where they don't have the ability to do that and that's something that the government affirmatively wants to prevent from happening. Uh, 
Um, I don't think so. I would hope not. Um, if it does, I would be very interested in that. <laughs> so it's an interesting question. There could be a legacy inside the United States of the Hong Kong student movement. Okay, we're getting down to the last one or two questions. Are you by any chance from the Chinese embassy? <laughs> yes, we need, we need some balance. We need a good Chinese I, Communist I thought, Party member to ask a question. I thought you were representing I them. <laughs> I, I could do my best to represent them, yes. Um, I'm Janice. I'm Janice Chen. I'm also uh, with the DPP US mission here. And um, I wanted to thank you both for really great presentations. And um, also, it's great to see David back in Washington to give us your first-hand account and your impressions that you talked about in the beginning of your talk. This way? OK. No, we can't hear wow. you. Um, the impressions that you gave um, in the beginning of your talk, David, about um, the, the protest actually was very striking in how they echoed um, the, the sunflower movement in Taiwan. Of course, this has been remarked on um, in many places, but just in terms of the order, the discipline, the commitment to nonviolence, um, and you know the sunflower movement in Taiwan preceded by the, the protests in Hong Kong by approximately six months, I think. And in fact, today is uh, the one-year mark of when the students withdrew from the legislature in Taipei. So um, I think in the aftermath of that in Taiwan, it's been really interesting to follow how it the movement has really, I think, um, reinvigorated and renewed Taiwan's democracy, and it's. Um, led to, I think, as we're heading into a major election, for example, the formation of some new parties, um, some smaller parties that are going to be running candidates for the legislative UN. And, um, you know, some parts of the original student movement, they kind of remain protesters outside the system while others are looking for ways to sort of effect change within the system. So I'm wondering, you know, going back to the legacy of the protests, how does that compare to Hong Kong? Very, very different institutional structure, of course, but uh, do you foresee that, that the leaders, you touched on this a little bit, but do you think that the student leaders are going to be um, sort of remain activists or do you see that there's going to be movements toward um, making the movement sort of a little more permanent in some way or will it remain kind of evolving, very loosely organized as it has been previously? Uh, well, so the, the connection between the, the Hong Kong protests of last fall and the, the Taiwan protests known as the Sunflower Movement of last spring uh, are, are very interesting. The, uh, what, what I know that we've uh, published about quite a bit in the newspaper, uh, the, something quite interesting and I think particularly important uh, in, in kind of Washington terms uh, is that the, the Taiwanese protests, the Sunflower Movement, were in their immediate sense uh, a protest to a pending trade deal between Taiwan and China. It would have been, I believe, the 22nd such trade deal signed since 2008. And the movement essentially said, uh, they, they, they made two points. They said that the, the, the government in Taipei had uh, pushed the trade deal through without sufficient um, government and uh, public and parliamentary oversight and that such trade deals run the risk of making Taiwan overly dependent economically on mainland China, which could leave Taiwan in the years to come vulnerable to economic intimidation. That those ideas are as potent in Taiwanese politics as they are, which was shown by the movement last spring and by the midterm elections in Taiwan in November, and might be shown again in the January to come presidential elections in, in Taipei, in Taiwan, speaks to the mood in Taiwan and the possible uh, future mood more broadly of cross-strait relations between Taiwan and China. And I think the connections between the activists, um, I would leave that question to the activists. I think some activists in Hong Kong uh, directly spoke of Taiwan, um, although I think they were not that interested in pursuing direct links to Taiwan. Uh, there was a moment, for example, this, ele this midterm election in November was on a Saturday, and by Sunday night it was quite interesting. I was down near the main podium of the protest, and the, one of the main student leaders was uh, quoting from the, either the Facebook or the Twitter page of the Taiwanese opposition leader who had said something over that weekend to the effect that, isn't it uh, to the great good fortune of Taiwanese that we get to peacefully vote out leaders whom we reject? And the student leader uh, in Hong Kong said, essentially, that's all we're asking for in Hong Kong. So in that sense, there's, there's a lot of resonant, uh, you know, mutually resonant ideas uh, and connections. As a practical organizing matter, I think there are no 
real connections to speak of. Uh, I don't know that, that we should expect them to happen, but, uh, but the question is about what the student leaders plan to do with themselves. Do they plan to remain activists outside the system or become uh, politicians forming parties within the system? Uh, my sense is there are mixed feelings uh, on that among them. Some may take the one path and some may take the other. But in general, uh, the impression one gets is they haven't decided. They haven't decided as individuals and they haven't decided as a collective such as there is one. So all of that is, is yet to be determined. Libby? I agree. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I think you're the last question. The microphone's over here on your left-hand side. Ken Dillon, Ciencia Press. You would think that the examples of democracy in Taiwan and in Hong Kong uh, would at some point have an effect on regional democracy movements within China itself. I'm not thinking of Tibet or Xinjiang. I'm thinking of ordinary Chinese provinces and regions. And yet somehow that never happens. Why doesn't it happen? And number two, uh, what would have to change in order for it to start happening? Wow. Um. I, I agree it's incredibly important to um, the people on the mainland to have as much information as they can about the democracy <coughs> in Taiwan and you know the relative freedom in Hong Kong. Um, you know, we see um, a record number of demonstrations on the mainland. Um, they are, by and large, more focused on you know issues of corruption and uh, political abuse, land grabs, um, things of that nature. I think that um, the Chinese are very, very good at suppressing uh, political activism. And um, frankly, I don't know what the appetite is to actually dream so high. Um, that being said, I strongly believe that there is um, a lot of interest on the mainland on what's happening in Taiwan and in Hong Kong. And um, there are many that would you know like to see democracy in China? I mean, you know, many of the Western world, um, countries included, and um, these lessons will be very valuable. Um, there are a lot of um, schools of democracy um, throughout the region that um, exist to help form a um, civil society infrastructure in China, and um, learn from these examples and. That's about all I can say. <laughs> David? I would second that. Uh, there's a very rich literature on the prospects for democracy in China. And th your second question about what would have to change. Um, the, pe the pessimism is growing, I would say. It, 20 years ago, the idea of democracy in China was usually uh, brought up with village elections. And everybody, including me, could go see a village election. And we were all told to be patient. Soon there'll be county elections and there'll be provincial and then there'll be kind of a New Hampshire primary for all of China. And just you Westerners just need to be patient about democracy in China. So a lot of us, I went with Orville Shell. We went to see a village election. Uh, Jimmy Carter was quite actively involved in helping this movement to draft how should the election be conducted. And we found out that the word election was a bit of a fraud. The village election rules were, I can run against David, but I cannot bring up any policy issue. I cannot say I'm for low taxes, David's for high taxes. I cannot bring up any other p political party issue. I can only say I am a smoother, more friendly person. My personality is better than David's. Please vote for me. And I can't even put that on a television advertisement. I can have a small group meeting with a megaphone and say, my personality is better for you. Please elect me village leader and not David. And oh, by the way, you know, he beats his wife. <laughs> I can barely slip that in. And the penalty for breaking these rules is you go to jail. So I think Orville Schell and I came away quite sobered by the idea that had been spread in the, the, the media of the world, that China has these so-called village elections. And 
those who've gone back recently tell me there's really been no change. Uh, there is some evidence at the very top in China that they want to observe certain rules. The president will serve two terms, five years each, and not, you know, promote instability among the standing committee of the Politburo at the top. And a lot of my colleagues in the China field have got onto this and said, you see, if we're just patient, someday they're going to have elections in the Central Committee and then in the Standing Committee of the Politburo. So this theme is wearing old now. It's about 25 years we've been told to be patient about democracy in China. So some of the new uh, literature that's coming out, there's a book by Andy Nathan uh, at Columbia, which is a set of essays called Will Democracy Come to China? And most of the essays are quite negative, that it will not happen. The level of pressure from the outside world is too low. The amount of money being spent is too low. And frankly, we made a mistake, I do try to cover in my book, that in 1989, when the Chinese Tiananmen students, I was going to ask you about the Hong Kong students too, the Tiananmen students, went. some of them went to Paris and they created an exile government. They said, we are now called the Federation of the Democrats of China. They elected a president named Yan Jiaqi and they asked for other countries to either give them money or even host them. We never did. The Americans uh, turned a cold eye to the Chinese exile government. So if the Hong Kong students try to have a continuing organization, I wonder whether anybody overseas will actually host them and treat them with some dignity as a political group, or they will just be thought of as sort of crazy students. So I tend to be pessimistic myself. That's sort of my answer to your last question. It's, a, it's a, probably the biggest question in U.S.-China relations. What, if anything, can we do about democracy in China? So thank you for asking it, and thank you for being the last question. Oh, I, do, I see a waving hand in the back. Do I dare go further? It's going to be Please. to the two of you. It's the Violence. moderator's prerogative. Right? All right, last question. This is my favorite word in Chinese policy. Uh, democracy was... Uh, Your microphone's not working. I think there's a button you have to push down. Uh, democracy was promoted after the transition from uh, Hong Kong, I mean, during the process of transferring uh, Hong Kong back to China. Uh, during the uh, Thatcher administration, she included democracy. Do you think that democracy would be further along if, in fact, it had been a part of the, their program while they were occupying Hong Kong? Uh, can you hear? I can't hear. We can't hear you. Sorry. It sounds like you're saying Mrs. Thatcher was an advocate of democracy well, in Hong Kong. What are the prospects? Well, the question is not so much about uh, Margaret Thatcher, although she was one of the negotiators uh, for the transition for Hong Kong to China. But my question is, do you think democracy would be further along if, in fact, when the British was in occupying Hong Kong, if, in fact, they had promoted democracy itself? They did not do it until after it, um, they had, the British had left. And my understanding was that after uh, they no longer occupied Hong Kong, when they transferred back to Hong Kong, I mean, to China. So was there more America, democracy in Hong America Kong under the British? Excuse is me? that the question? Oh my God, Louisa is in the audience. Yeah. What? When you were talking about Ned, I kept looking at. I him. could not see you. Um, can I? One of the most fascinating things that I learned through the um, 79 days <laughs> is that while the British ruled during the Cultural Revolution, that they were um, interested in universal suffrage and they were talking about doing um, direct elections, and the Chinese government was like, "Oh yeah, no way." If you do that, then we're going to have to change our status quo. And so, I mean, it's a very interesting issue. I think that we have no idea what would happen, but it, it had been explored even as far back as then. And secondly, my understanding is that when um, <clears throat> one of the negotiations, my understanding is that America was asked to, I won't say monitor, but basically to, to make sure that the agreement was enforced. So even though there had been criticisms for the most part about America not necessarily being proactive in this process, if in fact America is going to be the person to police the, the treaty and be primarily responsible, make sure that China continue to agree to the terms of the agreement, then of course shouldn't they take a neutral point of view instead of you know, being a punitive 
you know, an it, enforcer. It, it, it certainly seems the British, when they were running Hong Kong, could have done far more to promote democracy in Hong Kong. As, as you mentioned a moment ago, the British governor who was most active in promoting democracy was the last governor, Chris Patton, who came into office in Hong Kong after the arrangement with the Chinese about handing back sovereignty had already been made. So he took a kind of sprint to the finish and did some good in uh, setting up some democratic processes that the Chinese government then basically rolled back. That was effective in setting up the processes. It was effective in getting democratic sentiment uh, further cooked in Hong Kong, but it was an exception. By and large, the British were not interested in setting up democratic practices. But a crucial distinction, I think what, what matters for especially those of us not paying full-time attention to this and reading in the papers, the Chinese government and uh, various spokesmen for its positions like to say there's all this criticism that Hong Kong is not democratic today, but what about the British? They didn't allow Hong Kong to be democratic either. That's a clever diversion from the essential point, which is the liberal institutions of Hong Kong. The British had real liberalism in Hong Kong without democracy. Hong Kong today is demanding democracy more actively than they did under the British because their liberal institutions are being eroded significantly and systematically. Exactly. It's the free press, it's the free courts, it's academic freedom in the universities and in the classrooms and, o and otherwise. So the fight for democracy is a fight to preserve liberalism. That liberalism was consistent under the British and that's a huge distinction between the way the British ruled Hong Kong and the way the Chinese have been moving since taking sovereignty in 1997. I'm hoping that's going to be, be Libby's last chance to have the last word. I want to make a pitch for our future program. We're going to invite the president or vice president of the National Endowment for Democracy to come and talk about democracy in China and U.S. policy and the programs of the National Endowment for Democracy. We didn't really have a chance to get into that today. But Libby, you have the last word, and then we're going to applaud you. Uh, actually, I just wanted to applaud David's answer to that. I ah. thought that was brilliant, and it's a great way to end this, and I will love to come to that next event. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all very much.